Okay, so I'll give a couple more minutes for people to settle in. Um, thanks everyone for coming to our event today. Uh, my name is Bonnie Lam, and together with Eva Ierona Nimaki, oh, her last name is very difficult, <laughs> um, we are the event leads of the Career Paths Life Paths panel today. Um, on behalf of the GWAMIT, we are delighted to welcome you to this event, um, being our second event of the Empowerment Conference this year. Um, GWAMIT is a campus-wide student group with a mission to support the personal and professional development of graduate women. The Empowerment Conference is one of three flagship programs that the GWAMIT runs, the other two being the Fall Leadership Program, uh, Fall Leadership Conference, and our Mentoring Program. Uh, you may have seen some flyers out there um, that were advertising recruiting for uh, volunteers who'd like to get involved with organizing that fall leadership pro uh, conference that happens in the fall, um, as well as the women's welcoming lunch, which happens in September for the new students coming in. Um, the Spring Empowerment Conference is aimed at the personal development of graduate women and provides a platform to discuss issues that are relevant to the entire MIT community. So I'm glad to see that there are some uh, male attendees today. Um, hopefully the issues that we discuss, discuss here will apply to you as well. Um, today we're very delighted to have Professor Anne McCants um, standing on our right um, as our panel moderator. She will be leading our four accomplished female professors in discussing the challenges and experiences that they have encountered in their professional and personal lives. Um, Anne is the Margaret McVecker Faculty Fellow and the Professor of History at MIT with research and teaching interests in the economic and social history of the Middle Ages and early modern Europe, as well as in the application of social science research methods across the disciplines. She is currently serving as the director of the Concourse Freshman Learning Community, as well as uh, being the housemaster of Burton Connor. Please join me in providing a warm welcome to our moderator and panelists. Okay, this is a big subject, um, career paths and life paths, and uh, we have very limited time. So I'm going to give a very quick um, introduction of the four speakers together of their professional accomplishments in, in miniature. And then I'm gonna let each of them say something very short, I've asked them for about two minutes a piece, um, about their personal lives, the, the, the sort of the life path side of this so that you know something about them. And then we are gonna pursue five questions that were submitted to the panel in advance. And hopefully there will be time um, after all of that for you to ask spontaneous questions as well. So quickly, um, right here um, to my left is Muriel Medard. She's a professor of electrical engineering and computer science here at MIT. She is in the research lab for electronics and directs the Network Coding and Reliable Communication Group, so you will get reliable communication from Muriel. <laughs> I'm in charge of the unreliable communication. Um, in, uh, in 2011, um, a book that she edited came out um, on that same subject, on network coding, the fundamentals and the applications. And in 2004, she was a Harold Edgerton Faculty Achievement Award winner, which is um, the highest award given at MIT to a member of the untenured faculty. Uh, she's been the associate editor of several publications, spent a brief stint at Illinois and at Lincoln Labs, um, sandwiched in between her many undergraduate degrees at MIT and graduate degrees, I should say, and being here now. So that's Muriel. Um, next in line here uh, to my left is Christine Ortiz, who I'm sure you are familiar with since she's the Dean of Graduate Education, but she's also a professor of material sciences and engineering. Um, she's been the Dean since the summer of 2010, so she's hopefully got her sea legs now. <laughs> she does research in her lab group on structural um, and load-bearing biological materials with particular applications to body armor. So don't mess with Christine. Okay. Uh, the, the next moving over um, is Eva Maria Terzi. Did I say that right? Excellent. Okay. She's an assistant professor of computer science at Boston University and is joining us very graciously today. So thank you especially for that. Um, she's a member of the data management lab there. Um, and she has previously worked before coming to BU at the Helsinki Institute for Information Technology and um, as part of the IBM, did I get this right, Almaden Research Center. She works on data mining and social network analysis. 
And then finally, at the far left, um, or your right, I should say, is Katrin uh, Verheim, who's an associate professor of math here at MIT. Um, she does research on many things that I don't actually know what they are. But I'll tell you what they are, um, because you might know. Gauge theory, symplectic geometry, which I hope was better than the geometry I took, um, and PDEs. Don't know what PDE stands for. But you know, so. You'll, you'll fill me in, okay. In 2010, uh, she was awarded the very prestigious Presidential Early Career Award for scientists and engineers. Uh, and she will be on leave next year at UC Berkeley. So I don't know if I made it in my time limit, but why don't you all introduce yourselves and why don't we come back in reverse order? So Katrine, we'll start with you. Okay, wow, awesome. Um, so I'm gonna put one foot forward. That is not my main identifier, but I figured I'd just get it out there. I am gay and I found this out very late in life because I identified mostly as a woman in math and I had to somehow you know, affirm that, for example, by dating males. So um, it only actually happened in Cambridge. And I can, you know, the, the nice thing about it was that there were issues everywhere in life. You know, I lost friends, I lost my family, I had issues with myself. The only place where it was an absolute non-issue was in the department in the Hall of Mathematics in fact, people stopped talking about the people I dated. <laughs> so, so, and I, you know, I was also, there was a much bigger panel discussion shortly afterwards in which I was moderating and I had sort of decided to not say anything about my personal life. But somehow the atmosphere got so deep and sort of connected and interesting and there was a question that I just couldn't honestly answer with anything other than, look, I'm gay. And, and I did, it was, it was the most empowering experience ever. So I can only recommend that. Great, thank you very much. Um, yeah, I, I, with respect to my personal life, I think I, I'm single. And <laughs> uh, um, what else? I moved here uh, four years ago, or three and a half years ago. I used to live in uh, the Bay Area. Mm. Uh, living in San Francisco was the most uh, uh, eye-opening experience of my life. <laughs> and uh, before that, uh, I want to say something that like, I, I, I come from Greece. And um, uh, what I found uh, quite interesting is the difference in the perception of women um, in a small city where I grew up in Greece versus uh, how I feel uh, in San Francisco or here or uh, in the department and uh, uh, that's something that maybe we can talk about. Okay. Okay. So let's see, so I've been at MIT 13 years um, <laughs> and I guess uh, in terms of work-life balance, um, one of the things I've sort of tried to learn, that I've learned and I've thought about is that everyone has their own sort of equilibrium and that it's sort of a personal thing of how to identify and balance that equilibrium um, in terms of how much, um, you know, how to integrate those two aspects of your life, how much time to dedicate to them, and I think that's the hardest part, is like understanding like what your own balance is and what your own sort of equilibrium is. So, um, you know, I integrate my family with um, my immediate family, with my extended family, and so that I always, um, you know, work on and try to think about. Um. So I, um, I'm uh, the mother of four, um, <laughs> so, so the house is a pit, uh, and you know, when people talk about equilibrium, I, you know, I, I have this vision of something poised and graceful, <laughs> and that's not it. <laughs> um, so um, it doesn't mean that it's a stable equilibrium is what I realize they mean. It's just that at this point, it's you know, in equal, you know, it may be sort of tilting and sort of going towards <laughs> so, so, some unstable point that you didn't want to go and you sort of have to have a forcing function bringing it back up. Uh, but um, it, it's okay, you know, just as Christine was saying, um, it, it's up to you and um, uh, certainly um, my field is predominantly male. I mean, certainly, you know, my, my, my society's uh, uh, information theory society is well under 10% women. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, 
in a way that, you know, it's sort of there are no expectations because <laughs> who's going to set them, right? Um, and uh, so, <laughs> so it's, not, it's not always bad. Um, you know, it, it, it can work. And I, I know in my, uh, you know, in, in my case, you know, I, I felt wonderful that uh, I could, I still, I brought my kids to conferences and, uh, you know, they sat in sessions drawing or whatever. And that wasn't what people did. But in a way, because I was already so odd that I might as well pile it on. Uh, it, it's true, right? It, at that point, almost it doesn't matter. So anyway, that's so, well, thank you very much. As you can see, your organizers have done a fantastic job of bringing you a very diverse set of experiences. So I'm going to work um, our way through the questions that were sent to the panelists in advance. Um, but, you know, as you, and, and it may be that not everybody will answer every question, right? But, so just to warn you, but if, if there's a specific <coughs> life issue that is pressing on your mind, You've got a range of folks here um, who, have, who have had very different experiences. So hopefully we will be able to sort of address the spectrum um, of concern. So now I'm going um, gonna to mess with the panelists' minds for just a moment and actually shift the order um, of the questions that were sent to me. Uh, so I want to actually start with um, the, the, what I think is in some sense the simplest question and, and maybe the most important for a lot of the folks in the audience. Um, how, do, how has your personal life affected your ability to pursue tenure? And we've got folks who are pre-tenure and post-tenure um, on the panel or other career goals. Right? So maybe at least one of you that's pre-tenure and at least one of you that's post-tenure should to take a stab at this. How about, how about a pre-tenure person first? I guess this is me. <laughs> you, you just volunteered. Uh, but I submitted my in your case. <laughs> Excellent. Uh, so, um, I, I, okay, first of all, I don't have like a, a family or something, so I cannot say that uh, like uh, maybe someone who had a family and mm -hmm. uh, was pretending uh, had something more to say. But like for me, I, it hasn't affected, my personal life hasn't affected my, mm -hmm. um, I think that actually when I am in a relationship, I feel better. So basically I am in a better uh, um, a mood to work more. Uh, I also think that uh, in general, I. I mean, when I say personal life, I also consider social life mm -hmm. and um, other activities that uh, basically you have to do. And um, in general, I found the following thing very uh, useful for me. I have uh, time bounds. So I go to work and I only work. Sometimes I do get obsessed with some problem and maybe I work a little bit later. But I mean, ever since I defined uh, bounds and where I say that like, OK, I will work very hard until 6 p.m. or until 7 p.m. I put a, a fake deadline. And then I basically, I mean, I, I mean, I don't know. I feel that I enjoy more uh, my life. And then actually it works also. Like, I don't think that people, I don't know, maybe I'm making an overstatement. But I don't think if you work too hard, uh, anything really. Um, like, I think you have to work hard. But I think that working 16 hours a day or 20 hours a day, Basically, you work only eight anyway. So, um, <laughs> yeah, I mean, you have to divide, divide, uh, like, okay. uh, separate procrastination from work, basically. And uh, if you do that, then I don't, I mean, personally, it mm -hmm. has worked for me. Okay. And I don't think that, uh, I feel that I have the most uh, free time among all my friends, basically. <laughs> so I don't know. <laughs> yeah, OK, OK. I mean, I don't know, Mur Muriel, since you've already identified as the mother of four children, um, some of those were pre-tenure. Uh, yes. Yeah, so yeah. my, I had, um, I, I got, I, I got married very early. I was 19, and uh, so uh, had my first while I was in grad school. Uh, my second, when I had just started my first tenure job at Illinois, and then I was there for a year and a half. Started, and I immediately had my third. Um, so you know, if you're yeah. looking at case studies of how not to time them, right? Uh, and, uh, and then the fourth one was post tenure. Uh, as a matter of fact, when I interviewed for the MIT job, I was so pregnant. I mean, you know how you have those people that sort of carry it off, and you can barely tell. 
that's not me. <laughs> and people are like, do you know, twins, triplets? I'm like, no, I'm just, I'm just big. Um, so, and I was sure they weren't going to give me the, the job. I mean, I, I, I flew back home the last day it was legal for me to get into a plane, you know, for my interview here. So I would be going to the interview and people would ask me a question. I'm like, you're not using that chair, are you? Let me just put my feet up and you know, <laughs> I'm not going to the board. <laughs> it's not happening now. I, I, I was amazed actually that I truly was amazed I got the job. I still am amazed I got the job. Um, so I take the other approach, which is that because my life is so chaotic, um, I don't really have a separation between my work life and my home life. I bring the kids to, home, to, to work, I'll work at home. Very often, for instance, if I have to entertain um, colleagues, I can't just be taking off and getting a babysitter all the time, so I'll just bring them home, get takeout, and I have this huge table in my kitchen with benches so you can stack as many people as you want, and I just feed my colleagues with the kids. Um, <laughs> It's sort of like, it's just like a trough, you know, just put the food in the middle and they have to fight it out with the children. Um, it's not gracious, it's not gracious entertaining, certainly not what I was brought up with, but you know, that you, you do what you can and, and to some extent I think what's been nice for my children is that they've been able to witness my professional life, you know, um, which sometimes is good, sometimes is not good, uh, but, but it, it does, it does have, in my case I think I go to the extreme of blending or letting it completely seep through and that's the only way that's the only way I could do it for, for, given my, my own uh, time management skills or lack thereof. Okay uh, so I, I'm sure that everybody has comments on all of these questions but I think uh, let's let's catch Katrine and Christine on the next one and then if as I said if we've got time then we can sort of flesh all of this out. So um, I'm wondering if you could say something about how you advocate for your personal needs as a woman scientist or engineer um, or mathematician. Um, do you feel a need to be strategic, right? and we can think about what we mean when we say that, um, about your actions and in particular how they might be perceived by your colleagues? Right? So, so this, I think, also has some of the, the overtones of that tenure question. Right? So how do you advocate for your personal needs, whatever they might be? Do you want to start, Christine? <laughs> okay. <laughs> huh. So I think that um, there's been, you know, an increased visibility uh, over the last decade in terms of um, personal life, personal needs, and also the, the capability to blend. I mean, I, was, I would also say my life is completely blended. It's blurred. Um, and I think, I think Things are moving more and more in that direction of blending and, um, you know, flexible time management. And, you know, it's an issue both for, for all with families. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that the increased visibility, the increased understanding that, um, you know, having, you know, a rich personal life actually contributes to productivity and that, um, you know, both in, in, in a variety of sectors and in industry, et cetera, um, you know, there's there's an increased visibility also in this, um, you know, I was, I was at NSF a few weeks ago and there's a new sort of um, initiative on work-life balance and sort of using um, grant money for um, parents uh, to, when they're, or when, for mothers on maternity leave to hire um, staff to sort of support them in the lab. And so I think overall there's an, there's, it, there's an increased visibility in, in, in the need and also the value of facilitating it, there's also, um, there's also, you know, it's it's also in terms of competitiveness. Um, you know, the bar is being raised as to uh, what sort of work environment will facilitate um, a work-life balance, and so I think that it's becoming less. Um, less uh, different to advocate, it more e I guess easier to advocate for these things through formal mechanisms and programs like childbirth accommodation, childcare, um, and other, other aspects. Okay, so, so one perspective yeah. is just that the advocating is getting less problematic. Mm -hmm. Okay, Katrine, do you have? Well, it's, it's less problematic, but there's always the question of what message do you send if you mm -hmm. say, um, you know, look, I need to go home, or I, I can't do this now, 
do you give the reason? Do you not? You know, how how do you present yourself there? And um, personally, I think you, know, you you need to find your own way. I think what's key is that you're absolutely not insecure about what you what you're doing. You know, it's like you've made your decision and you're just communicating it and to be assertive about this. Um, and I, I mean, I can sort of combine that with the previous question. You know, for me, there's there's so many dramas in our lives. You know. Who doesn't have like sick parents or some drama, some you know, a relationship drama, whatever, you know, financial drama, some something, you know, your car got stolen, whatever. I, I can't work when that happens, you know. Um, because math only happens in my brain and I need my entire brain and I need it to be not distracted by other thoughts. And so I've started to just be totally plain in the face of people saying, you know. Look, you know, my father died. I cannot work. Sorry, you know. Mm -hmm. And I found this to be in incredibly useful, you know, because you get compassion sometimes, even in the math department. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> you know, and, and, and people, you know, if, if you're secure about it, people will not question it. Or I think also not really judge you on it, because they'll, they'll be more impressed, you know. You sort of, you know. You say, you know, look, I'm, I'm, you know, I'm not going to do this this month. It's just not going to happen, you know. Mm -hmm. And that way, you kind of assert your own value. You know, you actually say, you know, I'm, you know, I, I know I can tell you no because of who I am. You know, I'm, right. I'm big enough to, to say no. Um, so. So, so I'm going to abuse the power, actually, of the moderator for a moment, and 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 add a thought here, um, because Katrine has said that you know, everybody's life has things in it that happen. And we, I think, are, especially women uh, in the academy, are so used to thinking of the big problem being family, which means children, which means mothers, right? And, and in fact, everybody's life has minor catastrophes, major catastrophes, distractions, and so forth. And I'll just tell you one quick story. When I was a junior faculty member, I had a male colleague who was also a junior faculty member who assured me that no institution in its right mind would hire a woman when they could have a man because, after all, women get pregnant and then they're distracted. And this particular colleague, every single day, left at 3.30 in the afternoon in order to go to the sailing pavilion and go sailing <laughs> and, and told me with a completely straight face that the problem with women employees is that they left at 5.30 to pick up their children. <laughs> And that was such an eye-opening experience for me um, because somehow sailing was a completely legitimate part of his world, but children were somehow a completely distracting part of my world for my employer. Um, anyway, I'm still here. He's mm -hmm. not. <laughs> <laughs> so I just wanted to add that. Okay. All right. <laughs> Exactly. <laughs> but I'm over it, really. Um, <laughs> okay, I'm going to jump around again, and now, now you guys can fight it out any way you want, since I've made sure all of you got to answer a question. How do you communicate the importance of a personal or familiar, familial obligation to people whose lives don't resemble yours? Right? So, indeed, you know, how do you talk to somebody about, you know, sort of how distracting it is uh, to be woken up at night by a baby if they've never experienced that or, or the death of a parent or, or whatever. And, and how do you communicate that while also maintaining your professional decorum, your you know, serious stance as an academic? What are some strategies that you guys have had to use? Lies. <laughs> Okay, you might want to explain a little bit. <laughs> no, I mean, it's just, I mean, I think it's perfectly legit, you know? Like, you know, a tenured uh, colleague sends me email on Friday night, my, my kids are sick, can you make the homework problem? And I'm like, I can't say no, mm -hmm. you know? But I can appear on Monday and say, oh, sorry, I didn't read email. <laughs> <laughs> I was. <laughs> That's fine. I think she knows. <laughs> you know, but yeah, mm -hmm. you know, I okay. mean, sometimes if you just, you, sometimes it's just not the right thing, or even it's, yeah. it's not. You don't help the people by telling them the truth. Right. You know? Okay. You just 
So the, the judicious, I'll add that, the judicious use of incomplete information in every case. Is that better? I call them white lies. <laughs> Anybody else want to take a stab at this one? I don't even try. Um, <laughs> that's the other approach. You don't try to communicate. Uh, I just, I guess it's not so much I try to communicate the mm -hmm. importance or not. I, I just said, sorry, you know, mm -hmm. it's not going to happen. And just leave it at that. Mm -hmm. uh, okay. And... Um, I think, you know, people, I mean, I, so I think what, what happens is you basically, if you are generally sufficiently responsible, reliable, and, and so on, it means that, you know, when you said you're going to do it, you do it, and if you said you're not going to do it, you don't need to give a reason, and if you don't do it after you said you would do it, you say, look, I'm really sorry something happened, that, that's good enough, you mm -hmm. know, uh, because if it happens occasionally, then people should trust you that, you know, it doesn't need to be something where they need to know if it was something medical with your mother or your child or yourself mm -hmm. or what, right? Mm -hmm. uh, so I think... So, so Muriel, let me, let me push on you just a little bit. Is that... How, how long does it take for you to feel comfortable that people know you well enough that right. that is a sufficient answer, right? Because presumably when you're just starting out, it's much harder to say, hey, my character speaks for itself, <laughs> right? Um, and so they should know that if it was possible for me to do this, I would. And the fact that it isn't possible for me to do it is because it's really yeah. not, but I'm serious. Yeah. I mean, how, how long did that take? So, so the, the answer is I'm, I'm not sure, right? Okay. Uh, I think it depends. And, and part of it, by the way, you know, fields have very strong cultures. Right. I mean, we, you know, I think that sort of subsumes all this. You know, in some fields you can get away with certain things, in others you can't. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, eventually you become, you know, sufficiently known in your field. I mean, usually what, what will happen is, first of all, if you tell people as soon as possible that something can't happen. Uh, second of all, offer, you know, help, which means that you, it, in some other way, which shows that you're not wimping out. Mm -hmm. Right. Uh, they say, look, I, I can't do it by tomorrow. You know, something's come up. I'm happy to do the next one, right? Or the next two, or, you know, mm -hmm. offer, generally offer something that shows true goodwill, mm -hmm. uh, if at all possible, so that people realize you're really not, not trying to, you know, um, uh, you're really not, not trying to uh, um, carry a less than, than your fair share of the burden. You really can't do it at that point. And, and, uh, and then I think, you know, I call it quotidian kindnesses, right? If, I mean, if you're always being, trying to be attentive and, and, and kind towards your, your, your colleagues, then very soon, I think, you actually build that It'll sort of well. credit. Mm -hmm. um, and that's, that's my view, and maybe I'm, I'm overly, um, overly um, optimistic, so, but I think... So, yeah. Christine, I was actually going to ask you if you would speak to this yeah. as well, because presumably in your life as a dean, you have a lot less control. Yeah, I mean, I think things that, that happen to you. <laughs> <laughs> so I guess you know, as as things start piling up more and more and more, like there there's sort of there's sort of a a, a uh, thing where you have to say no. I'll, I'd say no to a lot of things, um, and so you know, there there's a way to say no um, that you know, and also sort of saying yes to things you're really really passionate about. Um, so there's, there's a lot of no's, some for personal reasons, some for other reasons, finite bandwidth, mm -hmm. um, you know, and I think that you sort of have to get over that barrier. I mean, I used to say yes all the time uh, yes. <laughs> to everything and say no very, very um, infrequently, but just the fact that there's such a finite bandwidth now and so many, mm -hmm. so many things that you really have to just think about what it is you're really passionate about. What, like, what do you want to spend you know, your time on really, um, and, and, and also just get over the fact that you, that you have to say no to things. And I agree, I don't, um, I don't give reasons anymore. <laughs> uh -huh. Uh -huh. You know, I just, um, you know, there's just so many things that it's, it's yeah, impossible. So, you know. so actually, um, I was wondering if um, maybe even Maria, you could say something about this too, because you've already told us, you know, that you sort of set a time and then then you're done work and you're going to be doing something else. And I'm wondering 
you know, sort of how, how do you communicate that, I mean, once you've made that decision for yourself, how do you communicate that So decision? it's not that, like, I mean, I, I never work later or something like that. I just right. try to preserve. Uh, okay. So just, uh, like, the time is... I just want to say that, like, pro I just save on procrastination time. Which, um, but uh, with respect to uh, excuses and... Uh, so I also don't give reasons. Like, first of all, I have to say that, like, as a young faculty, many people ask you lots of things, and then they say, oh, do you want to participate in this? Do you want to participate in that? And it will be good for your career or whatever. And I think they are, uh, like, they have good intention, but you cannot do all these things. So basically, I think it's better, at least for, for me, I found out, that, like, it's better to say no than say yes and do a half uh, mm -hmm. a good job. Mm -hmm. So in general, I prefer to say, like, in the majority of the cases, I say no because I want to say yes only if I know that I can do something like as a project. When it comes to a favor, I, try, I mean, I try to accommodate if I have uh, uh, time to do it, but uh, if I don't have and something comes up, I say no, I don't have to give an excuse. I, I mean, nobody, I think this is an, an illusion. Nobody expects an excuse. You don't have to, re like if you say no, I cannot do this right now, nobody is going to, go to ask you why. Nobody. And why should you say? It's okay. Like, Maybe sometimes you don't have a good excuse, and it's mm -hmm. better to say, I cannot, and it sounds very important. And... Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I'd to like to, can I, <laughs> yeah, I just, just as, yeah. a, as a thought there, I mean, I think it's, it's, it's a, actually, I don't, I somehow always give reasons, but um, I think in Except some circumstances, I think it might be good <laughs> and important to give reasons, particularly when you talk to people that you're a role model to. Um, potentially, or mm -hmm. even you know, mm -hmm. a close colleague, because I think it's important for us to say, "Look, I'm human, and it's okay to be human," mm -hmm. and that you know, that's that gets very little communicated. Mm -hmm. And so I've totally, I mean, this is sort of a little off the wall, but I've totally told undergrad advisors of mine that yes, I had a burnout as you know mm -hmm. in graduate school, and they, I think that really helps them, mm -hmm. you know. And so mm -hmm. you know, sort of showing that vulnerability in situations where you can, you know, that that takes good judgment. Mm -hmm. But I think that helps to you know, just change the whole culture around us. Right. I mean, I do think actually there is one group that always asks why and that you actually have to take seriously. And that is the other side, right? It's your family, yeah. right? When you say no to them because you're doing something at work, I think you really do have to be prepared to explain to them why every single time. Um, as annoying as that is. Uh, <laughs> uh, and so it, there's, there's maybe an asymmetry here um, in the sort of the complicated relationships. Right? I spend a lot of time trying to explain to my children, who are mostly grown now and still seem to need me endlessly, um, <laughs> you know, why I'm doing something. Right, and and the and the one thing that's useful about that is it means that if you're if you actually are doing something at work that may not be the most useful thing for you to be doing, you know, they can often see it, right? Because it turns out you can't explain it very well. Right? So that's actually been um, a good a good reality check for me. Um, okay, so um, any of you want to tackle this next one? Um, can you give an example of a time when you felt you were treated differently than a man might have been in a similar situation, and how did you respond? Now remember, <laughs> you had okay, these I'm questions gonna, in advance. I'm going to start with the, with the <laughs> comical one. I, you know, uh, teach sometimes these large calculus undergrad courses. And uh, does, you know, I, Katrine ends with a consonant. I don't know, somehow. So I will, like, sit on my ball at my desk in my small office. And some undergrad walks in and asks, like, immediately, he's like, where's Professor Verheim? Yeah. And, uh, you yeah, know, I mean, sometimes I'll turn around and say, huh. That is an interesting question. Is there any reason? Is there any reason to assume that that would not be me? <laughs> but sometimes I'm also just pissed, and I say, "Oh, I haven't seen him ask in headquarters." <laughs> <laughs> That's so cute. You know, 
and, and they have a, they have a picture board outside, and they know the game by now. You know, they send them and say, "Oh, have a look at the picture board." You know, those, and those are those are never seen again. So I don't know whether that's. <laughs> I doubt that this happens to my male colleagues that much. Yeah. I don't know that this is the best way to respond to it, but I think sometimes you can also just be pissed about these things. I, I suspect many of us have had that experience, or something like it. And then, I mean, more seriously, I think it's good to think about what you're going to do, when, not if, but when that happens. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Any any of the rest of you have? I know this is a this is a. Th I mean, these are hard questions yeah. to answer. Um, so I had a very funny. Uh, when you said that, I was like, this has to be PG, right? <laughs> <laughs> uh, I, so I had a, I had a very funny um, experience. So I was asked to give a, a, a plenary, and uh, you know it, it was. Um, uh, so the email was, you know, dear Professor Medard, you know, we would be honored if you accepted to blah, 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 you know, copy a bunch of people. And I said, I'm delighted to accept. And then there was an email from one of the people inviting me, clearly thinking that he was replying to, <laughs> to another of the organizers, not realizing that I was being copied. <clears throat> <laughs> And uh, <laughs> and uh, so the, and, it, and, it, and it was in French and, and you know I'm from France originally and French has you know a much uh, uh, a much wider palette for expressing these things and uh, <laughs> but, uh, and anyway anyway so, so it was roughly like the, it was sort of a, a it, so the, the 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 answer is something like well we didn't have to talk her up too much chat her up but it's it's a very sexual you know mm -hmm. uh, way of saying that. Mm -hmm. And, and then the question was, you know, probably they wouldn't have said that if I was a guy, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, I suppose. I don't know. Yeah, but, uh, probably. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and I was trying to figure out what to do. Do I just ignore it? You know, and then underneath it was like, some other stuff about some projects and proposals that they were writing together. Mm -hmm. and, and what I did is I decided to just take it with humor. And I responded and I said, indeed, you did not have to chat me up too much. <laughs> <laughs> Christine's eyes are getting very <laughs> wide. <laughs> and, you know, I mean, you know, it was the most abject apology I ever received. It was hilarious. And I said, well, you know, he, uh, I said, your, your punishment is I showed the email to my eldest daughter, and we laughed at your expense <laughs> abundantly. <laughs> And uh, so, so the question there becomes, you know, how, how do you handle the, mm -hmm. these situations? Um, mm -hmm. And um, anyway, so, so uh, it was, you know, you, it has to be personal, right? You have, you have to be co feel comfortable with it. Mm -hmm. But I mean, in that case, he's never doing that again, I'm sure, you know. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and we did have a really good laugh with my eldest daughter at th this email. Um, <laughs> you know, it's up to you. Right? I think it's very personal, right? I mean, uh, but uh, anyway. So. <laughs> oh, ahead, yeah. I mean, I think I think probably all of us have had the the uh, uh, being mistaken for a student all the time. It's going down now as I'm getting older. Wow. Um, <laughs> yeah, I know, right? And um, you know, and also walking in the room and and you know being younger or just being mistaken for someone, you know, you're not. Um, and I think, you know, I just ignore it. And I, my focus is always on what I'm going to say and what I'm passionate, again, what I'm passionate about, like if I'm giving a scientific talk or if I'm giving a presentation, the, my focus is like laser on that. And it just, just goes, I just it goes right above me. I don't even, I mean, it's like a second. I notice it and it's gone. Um, and so that's how, I mean, and I guess that's a personal way of uh, <laughs> Did you want to add? No, I, generally I think that I'm less, I, I pay, I don't pay too much attention. I think things happen. Mm -hmm. I mean, then I think about them afterwards and I say, oh, probably this happened because uh, I was the only woman or something like mm -hmm. that. But the moment it happens, like I think it for just a second and the moment it happens, I usually, I, I am not, a, I'm, pro either I'm very used to the fact that probably there are not so, m most of the, my colleagues or mm -hmm. most of the students are uh, guys. Mm -hmm. I don't. I don't pay attention. Um, mm -hmm. It has totally. Mm -hmm. It's yeah. I don't. I don't really pay attention to. Okay. And so if I'm, something happens, it is yeah. uh, like I consider some. If something happens, I think that it's 
just because like okay you're a little bit different and that's I mean different uh, being different is also good yeah mm -hmm. that's so true. that that's uh, right. I think that like it's not always something bad right that happens it's mm -hmm. also no, that's a that's an excellent um, observation Katrina did you want to add something yeah I think I would I mean maybe I don't know I, I, bad things seem to always happen when I look at things so I, I, <laughs> I, I, I would add the, a lot much darker perspective to this. Mm -hmm. Yes, bad things are going to happen to you because of your gender. Mm -hmm. you know? People are going to maybe sexually harass you in mm -hmm. the department. Um, that's the worst at some level. But mm -hmm. they're also going to think you're just the secretary mm -hmm. um, and treat you like that. Mm -hmm. They're going to run all over you. They're going to think that you, 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 they can steal your results. They can, you're bad. Mm -hmm. they, they can just, you know, they can bully you into teaching another course. Mm -hmm. All of that, of course, happens to some extent to all people, but I think it happens a lot more to women. And the, the weaker we look, or the, you know, I don't know, the, the more caring we look, you know, the more we, you mm -hmm. know, people try to just steamroll us. Mm -hmm. And uh, that's hard to deal with, you know. And it's just, I, I think it's important to be aware that that might be happening, you know, because otherwise mm -hmm. you're just going to let it happen. Mm -hmm. I I actually think that that's a really useful perspective. I'm going to jump in again. Um, I mean, I, I guess, well, I look in the mirror and I don't look so young to myself, but people tell me I still look younger than I am because I'm actually quite old. Um, <laughs> Uh, and and have been mistaken for an undergraduate. In fact, was thrown out of the reserve book room when I first arrived at MIT with a five-minute tirade about how students don't pay attention <laughs> and they're always in places they shouldn't be and so on and so forth before I could get a word in edgewise to say, actually, I just joined the faculty. Um, and that person actually avoided me like the plague for the next 10 years because she was so embarrassed. But I, I think actually it's really useful to remember two things. First of all, bad moments like this happen to everybody. They do happen to men as well for this, that, or the other reason. Um, I suspect that Katrine is right, that they happen um, more often, at least in the academy still, to women, just because there's fewer of them, and so there are sort of more opportunities to be startled um, or aghast or whatever. Um, but, but knowing that, I think one of the most useful things you can do is to think about, first of all, you know, sort of how do I feel about that, you know, possibly angry sometimes, but also, but, I mean, but it can also be empowering uh, that you can plan in advance. I'm going to go to this meeting. I'm going to be the only woman there. Like, that happens to me a lot, actually, um, not as a sort of historian proper, but as an economic historian. I'm often the only woman in the room. And I know I'm going to be the only woman in the room before I go. So I think about it, and I plan for it. Um, and. And that in itself can be empowering. So I think it's really important to look in the mirror and say, okay, what is there about me that might make me not noticeable or that might make me invisible or might make my work look sort of accessible for people to borrow? Um, and, that, and that's actually a situation that has happened to me as well here at MIT. Um, opened a president's report one year and discovered that somebody else was taking credit for my work. Um, and... Well, it was good enough to get in their president's report, yeah. yes. <laughs> um, and, and I think, you know, you have, to, you have to be prepared to think about how you're going to deal with those kinds of situations, right? And, I mean, obviously, men have their work stolen, too, right? So, so everybody has to think about how they're going to deal with that situation um, if they're confronted by it. And um, so I think that's, that's really good advice. Uh, all right. Um, the last of the preset questions, um, and this is really now getting back to sort of managing your own life. Um, we're wondering if you could tell us some of the ways that you keep your stress level in check, whatever that means, um, when you're facing high pressures in general or specifically around situations where you're trying to balance, you know, sort of your work and the rest of your life. Although many of you have already told us that the two are so blended, you can't tell them apart. So let's just say, how do you manage stress? I think that will, that will be helpful for you us don't. to hear. It's you don't. To be stressed. Okay. 
<laughs> All right. <laughs> so, I mean, there is this, uh, there is this uh, concept, preconception that, like, we should not be stressed, we should not be depressed, we should not... I mean, it's okay, it's normal to be sometimes you're more stressed, some other times you're not, and you, I mean, you are not all the time stressed, but it's inevitable to be stressed sometimes. Sometimes things are stressful. And you, I just, it's better, I mean, I think it's better to accept it rather than try to fight it with it. So, I don't know, I think this is okay. what I do. I would also say that, I mean, you yeah, know, it's okay, because guilt is the one thing that doesn't, yes. doesn't help. But it, it, you, you can manage it, you know? And I mean, for me, fresh air and, you know, work out helps mm -hmm. with managing. I think, you know, there's sort of scientific studies certainly on depression mm -hmm. and workouts, probably stress levels and workouts mm -hmm. also. Um, so I try to just, I schedule it, you know, I just brutally put it in my agenda, you know, because otherwise it's not going to happen. Mm -hmm. um, and the other thing is also, you know, once you've hit rock bottom once, you realize things, life goes on without you, you know? <laughs> 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 You know, and with most of our things, you know what? If you can't teach that day, somebody else will step in. You know, if you if you can't do stuff, it's it's, it's not the end of the world. You know, mm -hmm. and so if you don't answer emails for two weeks, you know, people will figure it out. Yeah, you know? <laughs> and, so, and and half of them will be irrelevant by the time you get back. right, <laughs> right. Yeah, you know, and and somehow, sadly, you know, a lot of us need a really bad life crisis to to make that. You know. Mm -hmm. um, observation but it's yeah and I don't know that you'll believe me until that happens to you but you know just you know um, try it sometime you know <laughs> also when you reach rock bottom you always think every rock bottom you reach that it's really bad and then you reach the next yeah. one <laughs> <laughs> and then you say, oh, the there's another, there's another rock <laughs> Okay, do we have any uplifting um, <laughs> possibilities from this side of the table, or should we quit while we're ahead? <laughs> I, I just wanted to echo, I mean, it, these things again, I think going back to the point that Christina was making, it's extremely personal, right? Mm -hmm. What makes one person happy, what makes another person not happy? I mean, uh, certainly I think uh, working out for me is also uh, mm -hmm. something that, that, that helps a lot, and uh, if you've had a life for a while as, you know, an athlete, then I think that's something that will stay with you your whole life, that then you, that's something you can always go back to, right? Mm -hmm. uh, and um, so I, that, that, that certainly for, for me uh, helps a lot. Um, I mean, interestingly, in terms of life, um, well, clearly the children are a huge source of extra commitments and time and, you know, on the short time frames, you know, um, stress, right? Because you're trying to pick somebody up and somebody's sick and somebody's mm -hmm. puking and, you know, whatever. <laughs> um, but for me, on a sort of a, a, a longer time frame, it actually reduces my stress that I, have, I find incredible joy in them. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, and, and sometimes I realize I don't probably convey it to them as much because I'm trying to get them in the car so we can go to work, you know? <laughs> and it's like, yes, I really want you to wear two shoes, two. Yes. <laughs> One on each foot. Uh, uh, <laughs> uh, then we went over this, you know. So, so you know, uh, like I said, on sort of a short t time frame, it, it always, often looks like it's just some sort of a complete zoo, but on, on a longer time frame, uh, those things which are to a large extent making my life more hectic are actually making my life more calm because it gives me more perspective. Um, so I don't know if that's uplifting or just sounding like, yeah. you know, I'm missing something major. <laughs> <laughs> but, um, you know, and yeah, yeah. so. So um, I've, I've tried to leave a little bit of time. There isn't much, but is, are there any questions from the audience? Um, in the sweater right there in the front. Uh, I was wondering what is one of like, the main things you see young women do to sabotage themselves? Like, so there's obviously like the negative things that happen, but like what are the things that you see young women do to sabotage Could you all hear that? The question is what do some young women do that maybe sabotages themselves? 
Christine, do you have any thoughts on that? I mean, especially from your your yeah. perch in the Office for Graduate Education. <laughs> perch. <laughs> well, it's a perch, isn't it? Yeah. <laughs> from your lofty height. Yeah. <laughs> um, let's see. So one thing I notice is um, sort of when speaking, um, using sort of minimizers, like I'm not sure about this, or um, you know, mm -hmm. making a proposal, and then adding some language afterwards, like, oh, I don't know if this is okay, or this is just one crazy idea, or you know, things like that. So I, one thing that's a sort of a sabotager is um, using minimizing language mm -hmm. instead of forceful, confident language. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Ending sentences with a question mark when you're really making a statement, you know, the voice going up, mm -hmm. that's... Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, generally, I think, just, you know, being too timid, you know. Mm -hmm. if, if in doubt, you know, <laughs> just, you know, people might, might get freaked out and scared by you, but they'll remember you. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah, I think, um, I, I, I think I would... I would echo, from my own observation, especially I spent six years as a department head, and, uh, and, and one of the things that was really apparent to me is that, you know, sort of on average, my female colleagues were much more hesitant to take credit for something until it had really completely finished and panned out. And my male colleagues, on average, right, were... Uh, sort of more willing to tout the benefits of something sort of in progress, right? And so uh, even, even if projects ended up being sort of, you know, equally successful in the end, I heard more about one subset of them sort of much more regularly, and it was more present on my mind as department head. And I had to sort of very consciously look to some of my younger female colleagues uh, to sort of say, well, what is it that they're working on that they're not telling me about? Yeah, did you want to add something? Yeah, so, I mean, it is uh, in, in line with what you're saying that may, I observe that many women, when they reach some point in their career, they always, I mean, no matter what this point is, like they are mm -hmm. graduate students or mm -hmm. whatever, they always think that it's not them, it's not because of them that they are actually there, but something... I was lucky. Yeah, yeah, I was lucky, exactly. So something happened and uh, suddenly I am now at this place and... Uh, mm -hmm. But not because of me, while men, I think, do not have this perception about themselves. They think mm -hmm. they are there because they simply deserve to be there. So I think that women can actually realize, and don't feel guilty about... They should not feel guilty about where mm -hmm. they are. It's because of them. And once you realize this, I think then it's pretty mm -hmm. straightforward that, mm -hmm. okay, I mean, I don't know a favor. To, like, mm -hmm. nobody did me a favor or something like that. It's just... So I think that many of uh, these uh, um, um, reluctance to get credit or things like that mm -hmm. are due to the fact that many women feel guilty about where they are. That. Mm -hmm. so, so I, actually, I had a, a friend really set my head straight with that when I got the MIT offer, you know, because I said, I don't, I don't know I can go there. They, they'll have such high expectations in me. I don't know I can, I can meet them. Mm -hmm. And he said two things. First of all, you have a right to fuck up. Secondly, <laughs> their expectations are their problem and not <laughs> yours. And so if you're somebody be somewhere because somebody misjudged you, you know what? It is not your fault. Yeah, mm -hmm. so that's... Hmm. So, so on my watch, I've got like two more minutes. I'm going to cut you off, Muriel, and get another question. Is that all right? Yeah. Okay. Okay. Um, so my question is, uh, are the trade-offs real? And I guess by trade-offs, I mean like trade-offs between work life and personal life. And have there been times like in evaluating these trade-offs, which may or may not be real, where you might have had to adjust your expectations, or do you consider it that? Are the trade-offs real? I mean, what you mean is, I mean, are you really giving something up in either realm to yes. achieve something because in the other realm? Because there's only 24 hours in the day. Oh, that's not true. <laughs> <laughs> what physics experiments are you working on? <laughs> any, any of you have a, um, a, a quick answer for that or even a long one? And you can start leaving if you need to. <laughs> I just wanted to say something that respect because um, mostly what we've been talking is about an academic life. And I think 
to some extent. So by the way, I'm still in that, uh, I'm still in that, you know, I just got lucky. I, I, I still am, but I'm not guilty about it. That's fine. <laughs> why not? <laughs> I don't feel guilty. Yet. <laughs> you know, good fortune, why not? Um, but I think um, that um, academia in many ways is less forgiving, but is also more forgiving of certain things. Okay, you know, when I have to teach, I better show up, right? It's considered in poor taste not to. Uh, but, you know, compared to, say, somebody doing um, a medical career, right, where you have to be working all the time with, um, uh, with, with patients or somebody trying to become partner at a large law firm, mm -hmm. it's still far more flexible. It is mm -hmm. still far, far more flexible. And I would say particularly for me, doing something which is more on the theory side so that I'm not, if you will, bound to a physical lab. Mm -hmm. uh, yes, the results have to have a certain quality and you need to get cited enough and so on and so forth. But when it got written, it doesn't matter. You know, the fact that it got written late at night or, you know, while you were waiting in the kid's pediat pedi you know, pediatrician's office, it mm -hmm. just doesn't show up on the paper. So uh, from that point of view, it's also very, very liberating. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, I, I would echo that. I've said for a long time, you know, as long as I sort of work my 80 or 90 hours a week, it doesn't matter when I work them. So that's good. Um, the expectation that you're going to work hard, I think, is one you should go into this career with, right? It's pretty, it's pretty demanding. Um, but, you know, but that said, there are trade-offs to absolutely everything. Right. And for some people, if, you know, sort of denying themselves personal relationships or, you know, the pleasures of having children or what have you, if those are going to be debilitating, then the trade-off is actually the other way. Your career is going to suffer if you don't, you know, fulfill some of those personal ambitions as well. Um, and I think, you know, for myself, one of, one of the things I thought about, because I wanted more children. My husband said, you know, this is crazy. You shouldn't have, you shouldn't be pregnant at MIT before getting tenure. Um, and I finally said, look, you know, when I'm 80, do I want to have these children or do I want to have tenure? <laughs> and I realized that when I was 80, I'd rather have the children. So then it was obvious, right? And, you know, were there trade-offs? I suppose probably a little more sleep, right? What's but that? yeah, but that wasn't worth it. Right, so I think, I think the answer is both yes and don't worry about it. Okay, I think we are officially at one o'clock. I want to thank the panelists very much for their candid remarks. So, once again, thank to our speakers and the moderator for coming to my team. On behalf of the graduate women at MIT, we'd like to thank our guests with uh, these tokens and for the inspiring and empowering uh, <laughs> talks they gave. Wow, awesome. So before you leave, we'd like uh, you to fill the survey uh, sheets that you have. This is important to us to better organize future events.